Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's indeed a great pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, um, speaker, uh, giving us the Leading Lights Lecture. This is Professor Dan Lasserson. Uh, he is uh, currently a professor of acute ambulatory care. He joined us uh, last July. And so, unfortunately, none of us have seen him in person, but uh, these are the times we are living in. So he's been he's been one of us for nearly, you know, well, close to a year. Uh, so uh, in addition to his uh, role here as professor of uh, acute ambulatory care, he is also clinical lead at the, well, that's all written there, but I'm going to read, uh, tell you more about him in a second. So you can, you can read. Uh, up there that he's a uh, uh, clinical lead acute hospital at home in Oxford and also he's an honorary consultant uh, in Sandwell and West Birmingham NHS Trust. Now I'm going to move to a different uh, device so I'm not turning my turning turning away from from all of you but uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Dan. Uh, if I introduce him and give you all the details in the CV I'll be the one talking for one hour so He's got a huge number of achievements, uh, you know, esteem indicators, uh, grants, uh, and so on and so forth. But I'll just tell you a little bit. So uh, Dan got his uh, undergraduate degree uh, from Cambridge in philosophy and natural sciences, uh, followed by a MBBS degree from Guy's and St. Thomas uh, Hospital Medical School, and then followed by an MRCP uh, in 2002, MRCGP in 2006, uh, an MD degree from Cambridge in 2012, and finally uh, FRCP Edinburgh in April 2014. Um, so prior to coming to Warwick, uh, he was Professor of Ambulatory Care in the Institute of Applied Health Research, um, which is in the University Hospital Birmingham. And uh, he um, Sorry. So if you look at the current uh, academic leadership roles, he's team lead for acute care interfaces, which is the NIHR ARC for West Midlands. That's the Applied Research Collaboration West Midlands. He is the national lead for Society for Acute Medicine Benchmarking Audit, SAMBA, for all of UK hospitals. Um, and he's also team lead for NIHR Community Healthcare MedTech and In Vitro Diagnostic Cooperative. Uh, and this is for the period of 2018 to 2023. And he's also got uh, numerous uh, clinical leadership roles. And like I said, uh, many, many markers of esteem and, and several externally funded research grants that all support his research. So it's a pleasure to have you, Dan, and we look forward to hearing your talk. And can I also request everybody to turn off their microphones so that uh, we can listen to Dan without any interruptions, yeah? Thank you. Thanks, Merlin. Very kind introduction. And thank you all for, for coming today and listening. So I'm going to be talking about uh, what I hope will be the future of acute medical care, which is delivered across both hospital and community settings and the challenges that um, that, that poses and where research and clinical innovation can help. Um, I've got a few declarations first. Firstly, I'm an accidental clinical academic. I didn't intend to be a researcher, um, but I, I found myself needing to do it in order to support what I saw as, as, as the changes I could see needed around me in the acute medical care pathway. Uh, so I didn't set out this way, but it's a pathway that I've, I've, I've had to take in order to do what I think is needed. Um, I'm also, as a result, really bad at staying in the same job for very long. Uh, but to reassure work, I really like the one that I've finally got at the moment. Um, and as I talk a little more about what I've done over the years, it'll be clear that I am really bad at staying in the same job. But that's different now. Um, I've always been frustrated about how we deliver acute care. It's always felt not to deliver what's needed for patients in a, in, in, in a broad sense, and particularly those who I think can be managed in community settings. Um, and also, I've never, ever listened to any advice that anyone's given me about career paths, which is why... What I'm going to tell you for the next sort of 40 minutes or so feels probably a bit sort of like a labyrinth rather than a linear pathway. But I think sometimes that's just the nature of life and how we how we respond to it. So what is the fundamental problem that I think we need to fix? Um, this graph from NHS England statistics, I think, shows it quite nicely. So the top blue dots 
um, and the top blue line are, shows the inexorable increase in emergency hospital admissions over the years, uh, from 27 to 20, 2007 to 2019. Uh, the number of people who are have an acute medical illness and come to hospital and in whom we treat in hospital is increasing week by week, month by month, year by year. And that trend will just continue. I do not believe that trend will stop. The bottom of that graph uh, is in orange, uh, are the number of acute medical beds available in which to put those patients. And as you can see, that is going down uh, inexorably, and this is going down slower than the other ones going up. Um, either way, it shows you that there are more and more people that we're treating in hospital, but we have fewer and fewer beds in which to do it. And I don't think that is going to change particularly uh, in the future either. In other words, I don't think we're going to have a big increase in hospital beds. Whatever successive governments say, the reality is uh, we are not going to have a huge increase in expansion of hospital capacity. So the challenge is how do we as a system become resilient uh, with this increase in demand um, and a probably fixed capacity within acute hospital settings. So um, my uh, path through medicine has been a kind of a quest to understand the acute care pathway and particularly the interfaces with the community. There's a few photos and a few uh, things that tell you a little bit about the journey I've uh, undertaken and why I think that's that's helped me understand uh, the pathway and also the research that needs to be done to to change it. So I spent quite a few years in acute medicine at King's College Hospital uh, on the left in South London and learned an awful lot about internal medicine and acute medicine and stroke there. So I've a good five years there and, uh, as, as a junior doctor. I then spent a bit of time in emergency medicine in Woolwich, which is a really uh, tough neck of the woods uh, in South London, and learned a lot and saw a lot there. Um, I then moved into primary care for a brief sojourn. Uh, I didn't spend too long as a GP, actually only a couple of years, uh, and then moved into the more kind of uh, challenging areas, I think, of primary care, which sort of out of hours, sort of really acute work, and we'll talk a bit more about that, work within hospices. There's a photo there, which is a hospice I worked at. Um, that's actually used as a film set uh, for, for sort of uh, period dramas, uh, as well as seeing patients. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, hospice uh, in, uh, in South Oxfordshire. Uh, and prisons. There was a stage when I literally did drift in and out of prison, but that was to deliver clinical shifts. And I learned a lot about uh, prison healthcare as well and delivering acute assessment when you really do not have many tools and you're isolated from an acute base. Um, and then I moved back into acute medicine, but delivering it in a slightly different way that I feel could address challenges in the community. Um, and that's something called, we'll talk about a bit called ambulatory care. So patients sleep in their own beds rather than the hospital beds, but they are acutely ill and need acute medical treatment. I've done that from acute, uh, from community hospital settings. Uh, and also we'll talk a bit about how you can change an acute hospital so you can do ambulatory care within that context. And there's a picture of the John Radcliffe Hospital and also uh, the soon to be middle Metropolitan University Hospital. I'll talk a bit about uh, the importance that Birmingham has had, influence that's had on me uh, from Samuel and West Birmingham hospitals. And finally, uh, we'll talk about acute hospital at home, which is sort of the end of this journey, I think, and how we can bring acute medicine into the home of the patient, into care homes. Uh, and that photo there is one I took on a recent visit uh, with the patient's permission and showing the things that we often find in hospital at home, which is you need to use what you can to hand to deliver care. And there's the uh, meat cleaver that's often, or not cleaver, the meat hook uh, that's often used to uh, attach uh, drugs to curtain rails and to pictures in order to get a bit of gravitational height uh, for infusions. And there's some IV iron, intravenous iron, be given to a patient there uh, from the comfort of their uh, sitting room. So, one of the essential things that I'm trying to talk about, well, it's about detection and response of acute illness in the community. And the overall sort of structure of this talk would be that we'll, we'll, I'll discuss an exemplar of high risk um, and uh, the high risk patient that comes to perhaps traditional general practice or the surgeries that you may visit uh, uh, from time to time to get care, preventive care or, or for, uh, for acute problems. And we'll talk about the care model of traditional general practice and the care processes that are done and where I see that there are some, some problems. And then we'll talk about out of hours primary care and we'll talk about the challenges of recognising risk in out of hours primary care, why it's different uh, to normal general practice and also why it's important in the acute care pathway. And I'll talk about, about um, the trouble that we've had or that I've had in, in uh, trying to embed diagnostic tools into what I think is a very high risk area of the care pathway. Then we'll talk about the emergency department and we'll talk about congestion in the emergency department and what we've done about that. And then we're going to talk about acute medicine but from a community setting. And the key things I want to bring out are the importance of point of care testing, 
Uh, the issue is about how you change a hospital uh, in order to support more acute medicine outside. And then finally, some uh, cases that I hope will bring it all together uh, in hospital at home. So high risk at the community hospital interface uh, in general practice. I want to talk about transit ischemic attack or TIA. Uh, this is a really important condition. Um, and essentially, uh, patients experience um, a stroke-like syndrome. They typically will have uh, problems speaking or one side of their body, arm or leg, may stop working or, uh, or be very weak. Um, and they will recover rapidly. Um, and it's very frightening. Um, but often, because people recover quite quickly, uh, they don't all rush to hospital. Uh, they come to general practice. And the reason why this is important is because there's a high risk of a current stroke in the next few days. Uh, when I first worked at King's on the acute stroke unit, uh, we were on the first places in London to deliver thrombolysis, so clot busting drugs for stroke. And delivering that was was great as, as a medical registrar, as a stroke registrar, because you could see this, this amazing response. But sometimes there was no response um, and uh, and the patient was left with significant disability. So I've seen firsthand as a clinician how important stroke is to prevent. And here we have TAA as a sort of warning syndrome. And we know that early intervention with medication is hugely effective in, in stopping the major stroke from happening that's going to happen around the corner. And I got interested uh, in this when I first started doing primary care research, having just come from sort of acute medicine, stroke medicine initially. Uh, so how do patients interact with the care system? And so I worked uh, with Professor Peter Rothwell in Oxford in the Oxford Vascular Study, just seeing how patients contacted and accessed care after transit ischemic attack. Um, this was published a few years ago uh, in the BMJ. Um, and this is a very sort of simple diagram. I think a lot of my research is based on pretty simple observations, to be honest. Um, but he was interested in, in the time of day um, that, the, uh, that the patients uh, were, were calling for help, or the time of the day they had their event, rather, and how long it took them to contact their general practitioner. And this was a, we did this research after the uh, contract for general practice had changed and GBs no longer did their own out of hours. Uh, and so and what we found really is that patients were essentially waiting till the first opportunity to call their GP when the phones opened at sort of half eight in the morning. So depending whether you had your TIA on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, essentially the length of time or the delay in hours between your TIA and calling for help was a function of basically when you had your event and the GP opening hours. So there, the, that's why there are all of those sort of lines and gaps, which are basically everyone's waiting till the next opportunity to call. The reason why that's important um, is because a certain number of strokes will happen in that early high risk period, but they're preventable. And so we thought this was an issue that we ought to raise um, because it shows patients trust their GPs. But the way in which the contract had changed uh, and the way in which they access care um, meant that actually that some strokes were happening as a result. And indeed, we did find some strokes in this population based system where patients have had TIAs. Uh, uh, during the weekend or, or, or overnight. And so there's an issue around, around how the care model was structured and how it was trying to um, deliver um, an acute response uh, and how patients were accessing it. Um, so I thought this was interesting, but it turns out that GPs don't like being criticised. Um, and and I, I was pointed, helpfully by my colleagues, to um, a discussion forum uh, where people were talking about my work. And so I was thinking, well, that's quite nice, until obviously I read the comments. Um, and what I realised that, you know, I'd committed this huge social faux pas by criticising general practice. I realised it's like telling somebody that their baby is ugly, something you just don't do. Um, and as you can see, there's some pretty, uh, some pretty interesting uh, comments um, urging me to retire and not do this kind of research. Um, staggered that I even did it. Um, someone thinking that I didn't work in the evenings, though I spent most of my time clinically working in the evenings and weekends. Um, and the final one that was interesting, uh, who is this idiot Lasserson? I'm sure in my lifetime that question will be posed again several times, no doubt. Um, but it shows that actually uh, uh, presenting the research in this way um, was a challenge that I need to think a bit more carefully about um, how uh, my work interacts with the audience that I'm trying to influence. So I thought, well, I'll try and tackle the problem in another way. Rather than um, having a go at the care model, why don't I just look instead at the kind of assessments people are making in primary and secondary care to see about whether we make more accurate diagnosis of TIA. It's an important condition to diagnose, as we've been talking about. We can, if we get it accurately and we start treating, we know we can prevent stroke. And there were some clinical prediction tools that would help you diagnose TIA. So why well, not? Why don't I look at the, the clinical assessments made by GPs and the clinical assessments made by the neurologists, uh, not in a primary care population or a secondary care population, but the same patients who moved from primary care 
to hospitals to the neurology. So effectively, you've got a pool of patients and you've got what the GPs thought about them and what the neurologists thought about them in a sort of a closed, a closed box, if you like, to study. Um, so I thought, well, actually, let's see how well these, these decision tools may be used based on what the clinicians are thinking. And essentially what you find, and that I've, this is a, a table from the paper we had in the International Journal of Stroke, uh, that was looking at how well these diagnostic decision aids work based on the clinical assessments of GPs and of neurologists. And whether your TIA is in the front of your head where you've got more obvious type um, symptoms of unilateral weakness or speech, or what's called a posterior TIA, which can have a bit more of a broader complex of symptoms. Essentially, the, the cl clinical assessment tool works better in the hands of the neurologists, not the GPs. And we're thinking a bit more broadly about what is it that can help um, recognise disease more generally uh, in primary care um, and do we need to rely purely on on the clinical assessment or what point do we start embedding diagnostic tests and that got me thinking a bit more on a journey of how point of care testing can be used uh, in 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 the primary care context perhaps not for TA but in more generally this got me really thinking about it. Um, I, and then as I broadened out from thinking about cerebrovascular disease thinking about how well um, we can uh, assess the most complex patients in the health and care system. And for me, I think these are patients who live in care homes. And I got interested in thinking, uh, how is face-to-face -face care delivered uh, currently in the current GP model? Now, why do I think patients in care homes are so important? Well, I think they're the most complex patients we look after. Many have dementia, they have reduced mobility, incontinence, high risk of falls. Um, they have lots of conditions together on multimorbidity, and there are lots of drugs, polypharmacy. And that's a real complex uh, mix and requires, I think, a lot of face-to-face uh, -face assessment to understand the risk. And so, um, working with other GP, Jilly Evans and a geriatrician called uh, Sir John Grimm, we have Savvy no longer with us, uh, we looked um, at uh, what was it that prompted GPs to visit their patients regularly in care homes. And it turns out that it's basically the number of patients registered at that practice. So here we're looking, we're comparing in that figure there, patients who have, uh, sorry, we're comparing uh, the GPs who visit regularly with the practices that don't. And those who do visit regularly have lots more patients registered at their practice than those who don't. So it's pretty clear that, that if a GP or a practice looks after a whole care home, then it's in their interest to go and visit. And if they have a couple of patients there, then they won't. So you have a care home where lots and lots of different GP practices are providing care. There's very little proactive care that'll be done because there's no regular visiting. So, um, and so we we important to, to, to raise this issue. Um, but luckily that didn't upset the general practice community because they saw that that was the sensible thing to do. In general though, I got thinking that, that, that looking at the traditional general practice model was not gonna uh, win me many friends. Um, and so I started thinking about a high risk area in the acute care pathway out of hours primary care. And why, why is that helpful? Well, I realise it's nobody's baby. So you can say it looks ugly and no one's going to get cross with you. Um, but the main reason why I think it's important is there's a much larger population base uh, for out of hours primary care. So looking at all the practices in the population. So, for example, a GP who normally has a, a practice list of, say, five or six thousand patients, when they're out of hours, there'll suddenly be a hundred thousand patients that could potentially be calling. And when your pool is bigger, uh, that means there's a much greater chance of, of there being acute pathology that needs detecting and fixing. Um, so the risk is higher out of hours but you haven't got any diagnostics. It's not an emergency department. There are no diagnostics. You'll have your doctor's bag with your medieval tubes, your stethoscope, but very little else. And also, looking at the training, there's pretty minimal training really for out of hours primary care. It's not seen as a priority when GPs are being trained. Um, so they don't spend that much time in it really compared to how much time they spend in practice when they're training. Overall, this is a high risk uh, uh, setting and therefore it's really important to study. It's an important part of the acute care pathway. And this is work I did with Gail Hayward. A lot of the papers coming up will have Gail as a co-author and a lot of work with her over the years. And also with Charles Vincent, who's a very eminent uh, patient safety researcher that we learned a lot from in doing this work. And essentially, we looked at patients who came to out of hours primary care uh, and then were sent home and then came back again sick and needed to go to hospital. And we looked at the kind of um, conditions uh, that uh, were being uh, diagnosed or considered to be wrong at that first presentation. And the top one were when the GPs thought that there was a social problem. And this is a really uh, interesting area for me because when things are, are said a social problem, what, you're, what we're saying is that there's uh, some kind of functional decline that means the current social setup isn't really able uh, to support that individual. 
Um, and so the, the label area was a social problem, but actually it may be an underlying medical problem uh, resulting in, in some de- reduction in function. And that's why it appears social. But the actual disease process itself isn't really evident. It hasn't sort of established itself more clearly. And that's often what we see in the older adults with frailty and acute functional decline. And it's not clear what the underlying illness is unless you do a bunch of diagnostic tests. So we looked a bit more closely um, about risk in general out of ours primary care. This is some work I did in Birmingham, something called BOARD, uh, it's the Birmingham Out of Hours Research Database that is based on, on Badger Healthcare. And uh, they've worked a, a lot with us over a uh, very few years. And we go up to Faye Wilson for, um, for, for, for being a research partner with us. And she's the medical director. And what, what Badger do, which is really ahead of the times in many ways, is, is they record all the vital signs. So that's the blood pressure, the heart rate, how quickly you're breathing um, and, and temperature. And and oxygen levels as well. So the uh, there are national scores or news and national earning warning scores that basically add up all of the uh, uh, vital signs to sort of get an overall measure of, of 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 how healthy or unhealthy the individual whom you're measuring is. And that's really important in the acute care pathway because it helps you understand risk. And so what we did, which I say is in a sense was quite sneaky, is that we used the vital signs that were being measured routinely in this data set and we calculated this new score. Now, at that time, that new score wasn't automatically calculated. The doctors had to decide themselves they wanted to do it. Um, And so we then said we looked at what the doctors did in terms of did they refer the patients to hospital or did they say, no, you're okay, you can go home, Um, either reassuring them or, or prescribing. And the blue line there are patients who were sent home and the orange line are patients who are referred um, and we're showing the frequency of each new score. So a new score of zero, in other words, nothing is particularly risky about that person, it's the highest proportion. And that feels about right for primary care population. Um, But then the new scores go up um, and as risk goes up and we think of sort of low risk, anything up to three or four, medium risk is sort of five and then high risk seven and above. And that grey dotted line are the proportion with each score who are referred. And as you can see, with new score of zero, not many are referred, and the new score of 11, everyone's referred. Um, but the uh, there are patients who are technically sort of medium risk, where they think, oh, there's something going on, um, where, you know, less than half are being referred. So it's unclear at the minute, is that because um, the new score itself doesn't really validate in this setting, or is there an under-recognition of risk if it's not based uh, or a isn't being based on, on risk predicted by physiology. And that was one of the things we couldn't quite work out from this paper, so we thought we'd better do some more work. And here we work with an ambulance trust uh, and with um, um, other acute physicians and GPs as well uh, to look at a whole health system. This was in Hampshire. And we were looking at um, new scores that were being measured in primary in a primary care setting and what happened next and the and the big things to 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 try and predict really are whether something to go to critical care so intensive care unit um or, or death and what we find is that over low to medium to high there is indeed what we call a calibration so the for patients who are low risk on a new score calculated in the community uh, based on measures undertaken in the community, the risks of death or critical care admission um, are lower. And then for patients who have a higher score, uh, those the risks of death um, or critical care admission are higher, both at five days and at 30 days. Um, and that's recorded on referral by the GP to hospital. So there's a sense in which that there is indeed um, an importance of that new score in the testing, and it may well uh, indicate risk. Uh, and as such, um, now it's pretty standard across the acute care pathway, or indeed that's what the, the, the guidelines are. Um, but it just shows us that actually the importance of, of that standardisation uh, in the out of hours uh, primary care setting. Now, um, the other issue around referral, of course, is we're talking about this as if it's just one particular system referring or not. And the reality is, of course, lots of different doctors working out of hours primary care as they do in hospital practice and in traditional general practice, too. Um, and so we got interesting and in, interested in variation among doctors. And we're interested in what we might call a propensity to refer. Are there some doctors who refer a lot? Are there some doctors who refer very little? So we looked at um, uh, people's sort of referral habits, if you like, over a number of years. Um, And this is some uh, work that we did uh, with mathematicians in Southampton, where we looked at uh, variation to refer from out of hours, private care to hospital, uh, and what 
sort of uh, risk threshold effectively that the different doctors are working at. And this sort of scattergram uh, of, of each, each, each blue uh, dot is a different doctor. Uh, and it shows that even for patients, for, for doctors, if you like, you see quite a few patients in out of hours, they do a lot of work, you know, a thousand consultations plus. Um, there's variation from sort of 20 percent down to three or four percent. And they're working in very, very similar parts of the system. So some doctors refer more and some doctors refer less. Um, and then we did some uh, work uh, to simulate uh, what would happen uh, by running lots and lots of simulations uh, if you sort of change to who would be allowed to work in 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 out of hours primary care if you just change the structure based on on uh, on on their risk and you can change the number of people being sent to hospital um, by fifty to one hundred per week um, just by uh, having different doctors who have different referral thresholds. Something for us for for, for the um, acute care system to think around is around individual doctors' behaviour. But what is driving that? Is that is that a difficulty in in, ass in assessing risk, or we're not standardising risk, or we're not embedding diagnostics? And we did we had some uh, money from the Health Foundation to study this because we did wonder. Well, actually, if we put point of care testing, and we'll talk a lot more about point of care testing as this talk goes on, if we embed it in the out of hours care system, could we recognise risk or make early diagnoses? And would some of that variation um, um, settle down, as it were, if we were able to either rule out disease or rule it in? Um, and what we found in our sort of journey to embed point of care testing in this context is that there's huge amounts of enthusiasm for it from the paramedics who work in out of hours primary care and from the nurses, um, but much less enthusiasm from the GPs. Um, and the work we did with them, because we did some qualitative work to try and understand their, their thoughts, were, well, they often make binary decisions. Is this patient going to hospital or are they staying at home? They're not really involved in ongoing care. So a formal diagnosis, which may imply uh, the need for ongoing care um, was 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 less helpful in that acute setting. If they thought this patient needed, for example, a treatment, treatment, they'd go to hospital. If they didn't, then they'd stay at home. And and then we looked at the proportion of home visits where a blood test was performed, and overall it was very low. Um, but the emergency care practitioners, who are paramedics or nurses, used it a lot more than the GPs, um, although still absolute terms, um, in small percentages. So that was. Uh, in many ways, a dismal failure of point of care test implementation, uh, but we learned a lot about it. So I want to talk about the emergency department now as we move up the escalation ramps, if you like, the acute care pathway. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort of get under the bonnet and understand um, the problems in the emergency department around the congestion, uh, because they are very busy places um, outside of the COVID pandemic. Um, and certainly in my sort of professional lifetime, as it were, uh, the four hour wait was introduced um, to um, a lot of uh, uh, criticism initially, but then people could see the value of it because it, it triggered investment into the emergency department, but it didn't make it a very pressured place. And um, we want to know, well, actually, who is it who breaks this four hour wait? Who stays in the emergency department for more than four hours before they're sent home um, or before they are um, sent to a ward if they're being admitted? And we looked at five years worth of data. This is the John Radcliffe Hospital. And we wanted to see, well, uh, you know, who is it that gets that that, that that breaches this? And essentially, it's a linear function with age. That red line there uh, is the proportion um, of patients who, who 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 breach that four hour wait, and the age is at the bottom from naught to one hundred plus, which is the the life course now that we're seeing. And uh, uh, we kind of wanted to again dig more deeper into the notes and say, well, what, why why is it that these patients who are older, um, uh, or as you get older, the chance of breaching is much much higher than you're staying longer on the emergency department? Is it because you're waiting for a bed? And the answer is, well, no, it's not. Uh, it's because the patients are having more and more tests done, have more and more modalities of tests. So whether you're sent home, uh, be over four hours or admitted, um, the ED docs are having to scratch their heads and think a lot more carefully about these complex patients uh, and doing more and more tests to uncover what's wrong. Some of them may be because, um, as we're talking about, the, the acute functional decline just not being quite right today is often um, how the older and frail patient presents. Um, and so you need to get your thinking cap on and make sure you've had a really good a good look uh, around to understand what of the many potential diseases uh, and conditions could be happening uh, to affect the function of this older adult and make them acutely unwell. So then we're thinking, well, maybe we're going to reduce congestion in the D. The answer is not to build more and more hospitals and more and more beds, but to say, well, you know, what diagnostics and assessments could we do outside the emergency department that would be an alternative to going there in the first place? Um, and the other thing that we were considering was um, choice. You know, 
uh, for some patients, they may choose not to go to hospital and they may want care in another setting. So is the hospital an active choice? Well, um, some of that could be within what's called an advanced care plan. And this is where a patient and their family and carers get to say what they want to happen if they become acute unwell in the future. What would they like the healthcare system to do? How should they respond? And that could be anything from being for full escalation to, to intensive care to saying, actually, I want to have care in my home or care in my care home. And that's my choice and my right. And the health system should do what it can to meet that request. And this is part of my work for the Society of Acute Medicine, where in one of our national day of care surveys, so like a day in the life of acute medicine up and down the country, we want to see well, actually which patients actually have advanced care plans who come to hospital. And then we have the age of patients. So adult medicine starts at age 16 and above. Um, and as you see, uh, there are age brackets, um, 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on and so on. And um, in general, and we've got the proportion of patients who have an advanced care plan. In general, because it's actually pretty low. So even for patients who are over 90, uh, it's no, we haven't got more than 15% of those patients with an advanced care plan. But what's more interesting, really, is that um, if you split those patients up into those who have been in hospital in the last 30 days, um, there's not really much of an impact. So even if you've been in hospital recently, that hasn't prompted uh, the team looking after you to say, well, this is an advanced care plan, so we better write one. It's slightly higher, but not that much higher. So there are lots of missed opportunities, both in primary care and in secondary care, to establish what patients' choices are. So armed with this sort of logic model, um, we thought we, we need to start setting up new acute medical care services. Um, uh, based in community settings and that could deliver uh, credible acute medical care. So the our first go at this was with um, Oxford Health, which is a very innovative community trust. Um, and we were given a bit of their community hospital to uh, re-engineer um, as an acute medical ambulatory care centre. We had to diagnose what was wrong with patients. We didn't have a laboratory because it's a community hospital, so we used point of care tests. We'll talk about that in a second. And the ability to treat things that we would find. So we needed to have, give intravenous medication um, and we had to review and monitor if what we were doing was working. So we had to work seven days as a routine. Uh, and that way you've got daily review and you can have patients, um, uh, fresh patients daily who are acutely ill, um, who were who were selecting an out of hospital care pathway as their choice. So what are the core point of care tests? Well, essentially these are, I mean, there are many available. Um, uh, uh, this is the ABBA ISTAT system, but in the interest of balance, um, other, other, other manufacturers are available. Um, and these are very simple to use systems. They have to be for acute medical care. It's not being done by clinical biochemists. It's being done by uh, sort of a... Um, uh, people like me who've got sort of two left hands and uh, and I can't write very clearly. So uh, they're going to be simple to use. And essentially, you, you drop a few, put a few drops of blood into the little cartridge that you see there, and then you stick it into the machine. And the size of that machine is like a size of a 1980s mobile phone. And within a couple of minutes, you get the results on the screen of the clinical chemistry. That's quite different to what we traditionally think of for blood tests, where you take an armful of blood, it goes to the lab, and then, you know, an hour or so, sometimes later, it's available um, um, in the laboratory database if you can go and look it up. Whereas this is more immediate in front of you next to the patient while you're talking to the patient. Um, and, uh, and there's, and there's a, a change in the culture of how you approach that because you're giving all the information all at once while you're talking to the patient rather than having an hour to think about things while the results are cooking in the lab. And these are pretty simple to use and the quality control process every three months or so uh, to keep them on the straight and narrow and our central NHS laboratory of clinical biochemists um, keep an eye on all that system for us. But it allows us to do clinical chemistry um, out in the wild, if you like. But there's a lot of resistance to using that thing, partly because, you know, everyone's used to these very expensive benchtop machines and everything having a laboratory. So there's a well, the lab is the gold standard. Uh, so why wouldn't you use that? Why would you invest in all this point of care testing? And I, we wanted to look at this in more detail because we, we were coming up against this when we thought, well, we need to use these point of care tests. We know they're accurate, um, but is there a problem with the lab? And so what we did here to investigate this, uh, we thought, well, look, you know, if you take blood in the community setting and then you drive it to the laboratory, you expose that blood sample to ambient temperature and a delay in processing. So what we did was we uh, took one year of, of potassium results um, and we uh, and these potassium blood tests were done in the community settings, either a community hospital or a general practice surgery. Then they were put into a van, driven around Oxfordshire and then sent to the lab at the end of the day. And But those potassium results were being acted on um, as being what was the patient's potassium. 
So what we did was we took uh, the average each week of potassium and we plotted it against the average temperature. And what you can see there is that the average potassium of the good citizens of Oxfordshire is just above 4.3 in winter and in the height of summer it's just below 3.8. Now there is no uh, there is no uh, change in the body's potassium uh, with outside temperature uh, so this is actually a, a, a false relationship if you like and it's not the case that in summer everyone walks around with a lower potassium than they do in winter. Uh, this reflects the fact um, that uh, if you uh, transport blood from someone to a laboratory and that tells what takes time and you expose it to temperature then you're not going to get the right result and so if you do a point of care test all of that delay and temperature impact just disappears and so that was an important part of our of our of our um arguments to why we should move to point of care and we did some more validations in the field published in acute medicine last year um and this was because uh most lab validations are uh, of point of care testing are done by proper scientists uh, in, in laboratories rather than people like me seeing patients uh, in the middle of a busy shift. And so we did what's called a, a clinical validation rather than more lab validation, where we uh, compared how you know a, a, a clinician using this uh, machine uh, in, during a, a busy shift. So it's almost protocol, but not exactly because you'll be in the middle of doing it and somebody will call you or give you a, an ECG a heart tracing to look at. So you won't do things precisely by the book because you'll be doing spinning lots of other places at once. And we, we presented these bias plots um, where we looked at the formal lab, his creatinine, for example, the formal lab creatinine um, and the creatinine that we did from our machine. It's important to test a renal function. You find that there's a slight overread and a slight bias, but it doesn't actually change what we do. So although for a chemist, I don't think they'll be horrified if that that's a 10% bias. For us, they would go, well, if the creatinine is 600 and the kidney's sick, and if my machine says it's 660, the fact that it's 600 uh, doesn't matter. This is a really sick kidney. So whilst, for example, it may uh, be a problem for sort of for purists, actually, in terms of clinicians, they're still really, really useful tools because they tell us if your kidneys are working well or not in a more sort of binary way. Um, but more importantly, um, as we studied how we developed uh, the, our, our embedding a point of care test uh, with a workforce, um, a lot of the nurses who became expert at using the point of care test and became our, our effectively our biochemistry lab um, were enhancing their skills and were really seeing the value um, of, of the point of care testing in a community setting. And there's some quotes there from the quality work we did as a lot of, a, of an NPT study. Um, uh, and so essentially it showed that as things developed, uh, it was the nurse that began making those earlier diagnoses before the doctors did um, and were quite accurate in telling us um, what to do and what was wrong with the patients. And we're really owning much more of that diagnostic process. Um, but there are many challenges of trying to do um, acute ambulatory care as people get older and are more frail. Um, so here is the most frequent conditions uh, and presented complaints of patients that we saw in that ambulatory, that community-based ambulatory care centre. Um, and so uh, as we've been talking about, it's sort of decreased mobility and an increased sort of care needs and a functional decline is that is the commonest uh, uh, issue in the older adult. Um, but as a single uh, symptom issue, breathlessness is our number one. And we'll come back to that um, because that's where point of care tests uh, can really help us. Uh, and we'll, we'll we'll discuss that in more detail. But it shows that that, that uh, we were trying to deliver acute frailty care um, in, in this cohort. And we're really seeing the right sort of patients for us to do that, but from a community setting. Now, the issue really is around, are you able to maintain an ambulatory pathway? So anyone can set up a, an ambulatory care centre. If you find that you can't actually uh, care for the patients, you have to send them all to the hospital. And here we've got uh, those sort of pie charts just show us, I think, clearly what happens when we try and deliver ambulatory care to an older and older population. And that's really what we need to be able to deliver effectively uh, if we're going to support our population. Um, and so if you're under 65, um, most of that pie chart is white. What that means is that uh, treating those patients who had an acute illness, um, the vast majority were ambulatory at 30 days. In other words, all their care was delivered without needing a hospital bed or hospital stay. And as we go up the ages from 65 to 85, from, from 85 onwards, and above 85, patients are beginning to develop significant frailty, by and large, if we were to, to uh, use a, a, an age, although age is really a very poor guide for frailty, we found that actually just less than half of patients are able to be treated as an ambulatory uh, basis. And in that, that grey pie 
bit of that that segment of that gray segment you like of that pie chart are those where we try and uh, deliver an out of hospital pathway uh, but actually uh, they need to come to hospital within that month so even if you do try and do out of hospital care um, that strategy will, will not succeed in the, in, the, in the proportion of those patients over 85 and many as you can see there um, will require immediate admission admission to hospital so uh, although you can set out to do ambulatory care it's hard to deliver it in its totality for that group I think well um, uh, what are the challenges of doing that? And so, again, this is uh, some funding, uh, this is a study that we did, funded by the Dental Trust this time, to uh, really get under the bonnet of patient experience in ambulatory care for frail patients with an ethnography where a one of our qualitative researchers, Margaret Kogoska, would um, sit with the patients as they're being treated, I would visit them at home um, and would do sort of follow-up calls as well to sort of understand their experience longitudinally. And many of them who uh, of our patients who we treat in this way um, were treated with bed-based care previously and they had an ambulatory alternative. Heart failure is a good example where we can treat patients uh, uh, relatively well outside hospital when previously we tended to admit many. And they said, well, it'd be ridiculous to put me in a bed. And there's some really interesting comments coming out about how um, there were some very positive elements of um, of out of hospital care and for, so some patients who who did not feel safe in hospital be able to address acute medical care need and treat but also being able to those patients being known help um, increase their sense of safety rather than reducing it and that was noted by some carers however however um uh, it's it's tiring because you know patients are coming to the center the ambulatory care center, and going home again um and we are adding a burden by doing that um, and we didn't really get a, an understanding or a handle on that until until we did this um, ethnography. So I found it really interesting just just, just sitting down with Margaret and reading through uh, what people were saying and Margaret's interpretation. Uh, so that actually there are some, some negative impacts of what we're doing here. We need to think more broadly about what we're doing. So um, I want to just make a quick a quick detour to an acute hospital at this point. So we've gone as far as we could with our community-based ambulatory care centre. At that point, um, it was felt that actually the main hospital in Oxford uh, should change and try and, in, and embed a more ambulatory mindset. Um, and I want to just talk very briefly about, about changing a culture in a key hospital, because that has been an important part of my journey, I think. Um, and up until this point, I suppose, I thought that hospitals um, obeyed Newton's laws of motion. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. When you try and do something, the system resists you, uh, and uh, uh, an object will only change its course and direction if an external force is applied. So they'll only do something significantly differently if either NH England says it or the CQC says it. And this was a very different experience, actually. Um, and um, my colleagues in the acute medicine and geriatric department um, are, were, were, were hugely supportive um, of this journey, as was the exact corridor. Um, and essentially, uh, I took up this interface physician role, so left research uh, and became sort of full time clinician, but with a with, with a clinician on a mission to uh, to deliver more acute ambulatory medicine within an acute setting rather than the community hospital setting. So it started with me going to the emergency department, finding patients I thought I could uh, treat on an ambulatory basis and send home. And I'd take them up to a day hospital, uh, see them, treat them um, and then send them home afterwards. And then uh, that seemed to work pretty well. So pretty rapidly, we were given some space on one of the geriatric wards uh, to to form an ambulatory care unit and we'd be given our own nurses and uh, so we could sort of function uh, in a more of a multidisciplinary way. Uh, and then that rapidly went from three bedrooms to 10 bedrooms because we were seeing more and more patients. And then we took all the GP medical care referrals, uh, at which point uh, we could decide who goes to acute medical take uh, rather than the medical take deciding which patients could go to ambulatory care. And we got our own point of care diagnostics for rapid decision making. And then uh, that sort of uh, took off and so by July, um, they were then closed a whole medical ward and reopened it as an acute assessment unit, had more and more junior staffing, increased our footfall. Um, and now this unit sees up to 70 patients a day and sees more than half the medical take. Uh, so um, it, it was an interesting journey uh, to sort of put down the research tools, although not, not totally, uh, and to focus on, on what I'd learned to date um, around reorganising acute medical care. But obviously, you can't put an academic down, so we still wrote about it. Uh, and this was published uh, last year in the Future Healthcare Journal, uh, just to show the impact uh, of what we were doing. I suppose there's, there's going to be two main things we want to focus on this figure, really. 
uh, which is that the, the light green areas are the sort of the non-ambulatory uh, group um, and looking at how many sort of uh, episodes per month um, there were over the years. And essentially those, those lighter green areas are decreasing and that's the, the, the bed-based traditional medicine pathways going down. Um, and in, in the, the, the darker green are the ambulatory or AEC, ambulatory emergency care units, and they're going up and up and up. So what we've done, we've effectively moved the system from an inpatient system and to try and, and move whatever we can towards being treated on, on, an, on an acute ambulatory basis. So gradually sort of shifting um, how 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 the total acute medical care was delivered, and for those patients that could be seen on an ambulatory basis, we were seeing on an ambulatory basis. But um, as before, you will still come across the issues of the fact that you are adding burden for the older and frail patients. Uh, and so, think well, actually, what could we do to replace that acute hospital assessment purely in the community, so the patient doesn't have to move anywhere? And one of the one of the limitations that we've done at that point was in point of care blood testing, and we weren't able to sort of you know say is there heart failure or is there you know an, uh, uh, an infection in the chest, and we weren't able to to look at a more broader elements that you get if you come to hospital, as you get for example from a chest X-ray. Um, and at this point, we were um, uh, seeing that with these sort of handheld portal ultrasounds, so you can have an ultrasound any time, anywhere. And there are some uh, manufacturers there in the interest of balance. Um, I use a Butterfly IQ, um, but other 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 uh, other ultrasound manufacturers um, are available and make and make good equipment as well. And thinking about why well, your commonly encountered clinical problems, and ours, as we saw previously, was breathlessness. It's the ability to ultrasound the lung and look at the lung. Uh, is actually a huge advantage if your number one problem is breathlessness. And also with these uh, portable systems, they have image sharing capability. Uh, so you can record a, a, an image in a secure cloud and another clinician or radiologist could look at it and, and give you advice if you were looking for it. Um, and also the image sharing, your kind of training and mentorship, and particularly governance, is a bit more straightforward because all your scans are in one place. Um, and I want to just talk a little bit about lung ultrasound because uh, that's very relevant to COVID as the acute hospital home models that we've been able to develop. So um, uh, just a, 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 a tiny primer on lung ultrasound. This is what a lung looks like um, on ultrasound. Um, and that top white line there that's got that red area is the pleural line. That's the lining of the lung. Um, and uh, those two dark areas either side of that white are the shadows uh, from the ribs because you can't get ultrasound. Sound won't travel through the bone. Um, and these lines, those other horizontal lines coming down, um, are called A-lines and they are effectively artifacts. So a normal lung is full of air, not water, and air doesn't really conduct ultrasound at all. And so essentially the ultrasound beam just goes back and forth between the pleural line and the transducer. So it ends up creating these, these shadows or harmonics, if you like. Um, and that's if you've got normal lung. That's what nice normal lung looks like. Um, but um, as the COVID pandemic hit, there was some emerging evidence uh, that point of care ultrasound of the lung um, could be helpful in diagnosis. Um, the early experience in China from intensive care uh, was, uh, was, was delivered through a series of webinars um, and their experience was, was, was you know, eye-opening, but they were showing that actually there was maybe um, an ultrasound signature specific to COVID. Also uh, on Twitter, um, tr for physicians who could use point of ultrasound would be scanning their own lungs and, um, and on Twitter would be giving daily updates. So you could see actually the progression um, from, from these sort of um, uh, 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 brave clinicians who were who were being really honest about their recovery or lack of it, um, and and, for, and that's important because it may be that 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 the lung burden um, as assessed by ultrasound could predict outcomes, and if it can predict outcomes, then we can select patients at the front door who need to come in and perhaps reassure those who would be safe at home. So what does it look like on ultrasound? So this is um, a scan from the patients that I've seen. Um, so you see that pleural line, it's thickened and it's a bit more irregular, but these, uh, rather than horizontal lines, we're seeing vertical lines and they're called B lines. Um, and, um, and those B lines are there uh, uh, if they're made um, through, um, if there's increased water in the lung. Sorry, the text on that B line isn't correct. Um, but if, if there's more water in the lung, and then that, that allows the ultrasound beam to pass through. And there's a certain pattern um, of how that is. Um, and this is where sort of Birmingham and certainly City Hospital in Birmingham became really important for me um, because it's a centre of point of care ultrasound. Um, and this and Saab Clare has been a fantastic mentor. She's a, a real, um, a real uh, uh, outstanding leader of acute medicine and uh, has been mentoring me over the years with ultrasound. And I owe a lot to her. And this is the work that we did on the patients with um, COVID who were seen in Birmingham at City Hospital. 
And we um, looked at uh, their, what their lung ultrasound looked like, uh, and uh, we wanted to find a way to see if we could say, you know, depending on what the lung looks like, could we see if there's a, a, a relationship with outcome? So we found um, a scoring system depending on, on whether there are uh, those B lines, those horizontal lines, um, uh, sorry, vertical lines rather, uh, and um, and whether the um, the amount of, of change in the lung lining could also um, could also uh, uh, affect outcome. And we just basically added these up into a score. What we found that as the score of patients was from low to high, that it indeed um, reflect um, increasing risk of the outcomes, whether they, patients were deteriorating, required more oxygen, uh, and also is associated um, with death uh, in, in a linked way with higher lung burden. So this could, this could at least help us find out patients who we thought weren't going to uh, get worse, and perhaps those who were at high risk uh, uh, would, would be able to be um, uh, given a much more sort of closer monitoring um, or have earlier earlier referral to intensive care. So armed with this information, we thought, well, you know, if we were going to use ultrasound um, to detect that, could we use it in patients with COVID who are seeing outside the hospital? Um, and we wanted to know what's the capability in hospital at home at the moment. And so we did a survey of all hospital at home services saying, you know, what are you able to give? Can you give IV fluids? Can you give diuretics? So can you treat patients? What blood tests can you do? Um, can you give oxygen? Can you give antibiotics? Um, and lots of systems can give antibiotics, as you can see on this, on this upset plot. Um, but very few can give you know, uh, what looks like a very credible set of processes of care that could replace the hospital, uh, and none could do a um, point of care ultrasound. Um, so we thought that was a big limitation. Uh, and armed with that information, um, I set up a service that uh, could deliver all of those things and to try and replace the hospital based on all the work that I've done to date. And there's a couple of cases uh, just in the last minute or so um, of this talk that I think illustrate um, how we could replace um, the acute hospital. So this is a lady in her 70s. She's a resident in a care home. And uh, in, during the last wave of the pandemic, she was very breathless and the care home staff measured her oxygen levels using the pulse oximeters um, that were given to all care homes. And the air was low, 88%, so they called an ambulance. And she declined to go to hospital, but the paramedic with her was concerned, obviously, given that she was, her oxygen was low. So called the on-call medical team at hospital for advice. Um, and so uh, we got a bit more information. She hadn't been weight bearing for several years. She'd been bed bound for several years. Uh, she had lots of uh, medical conditions uh, and was very complex. And so because she didn't want to come in, we said, well, can the hospital come to her? So I went uh, with one of the um, nurses from my uh, hospital at home team. When we found her, she was sitting up in bed. Her saturation had increased a little bit at that point, um, but she was breathless and she was obviously uncomfortable. And she said she was increasing breathless for the last week. She said she'd accept care in the home, but she wouldn't come to hospital. Uh, and we're, other, we're obviously concerned because other residents were positive uh, with COVID. And this is her lung ultrasound. So I'm going to show um, a moving picture of this. Um, so that, that's the top of her left lung, and it looks pretty normal. So it's got those, those horizontal uh, A lines, so that's normal lung. But as we get further down, this is the base of her left lung, and, and that dark area is fluid. And that thing bouncing away there is the heart in the middle of her chest that we can see because there's fluid uh, the lower half of her chest. And just the right of that's her spleen, and that's called a pleural effusion. So it's a fluid collection in the lung. And on the base of the right side of her chest, uh, there's lots of those horizontal white lines, but in a more sort of... Uh, in, in a more um, regular pattern than you'd find with COVID, and that's more in keeping with something called pulmonary edema uh, due, to, due to heart failure. So, well, that's what's wrong with this patient. It's not COVID after all. We did point of care tests, and her, uh, the salts were normal, as was her renal function. So we gave her intravenous diuretics to get rid of the excess fluid. We did that every day, uh, and we did our point of care test day to make sure we weren't disturbing her electrolytes. And she felt a lot breathless and was clinically improved. And so our hospital at home was able to coordinate her care. We didn't want to, uh, well, rather, we wanted to make sure that she had access to hospital specialists too. So she agreed to come to our ambulance unit just once for a few hours. And it was like on one of those sort of F1 car um, uh, pit stops. We managed to get the heart failure team to see her. The plural team saw her, who said, yes, we agree it's all heart failure, carry on. Um, and then she was uh, discharged with ongoing care back in the care home after that few hours there, which we delivered, and began to start weight-bearing with community physiotherapy as her heart failure was treated. So it's a nice example of how ultrasound shows that actually in the middle of a COVID pandemic, you can diagnose conditions that aren't COVID.
And uh, one final case to illustrate what we can do with hospital at home. This is a man in his late 70s who lived in a nursing section of a care home. He usually walked around with a wheeled frame and he screened positive for, for COVID in an outbreak in the home. And around eight days after that, he became more withdrawn, wasn't eating, drinking much. And so we were called. When we went to see him, he was lying in bed. In fact, he hadn't eaten or drunk for several days. He had a very high respiratory rate, so breathing quite quickly. And his oxygen levels were low. We talked to his family and they said, well, if you're there delivering acute medical care, um, then the ceiling of care, in other words, he should have his care in the care home and not go to hospital. And our blood test showed that actually um, his sodium was high. For those of you that uh, are in everything, sodium above 145 is sort of high, really. So it's really quite high. And his renal function uh, wasn't well, wasn't great as well. So he had acute, acute kidney injury. So that's quite a challenge. And this is what his lung ultrasound uh, looked like. So you've got a mix of, of um, a thickened uh, pleural line, so those uh, vertical uh, uh, B lines, uh, which are sure there's fluid in the lung, but some areas of normal lung, with some, uh, and that's often what you see um, in COVID-19. So we gave him steroid, uh, we gave him oxygen, we got an, a concentrator, which, which, which takes ambient air and turns it uh, and skips through the nitrogen, so you're left with more oxygen. And uh, we gave him a mix of intravenous fluid, which nice and slowly. So we'd start it, our hospital nurse would set it, we'd set up the infusion, and the care home nurses would take it down a number of hours later. So we could put in slow infusions to slowly bring down the sodium. And we'd give a subcutaneous fluid overnight, again, with very low levels of sodium in it, in order to kind of gradually decrease the high sodium. And we gave him an injection to prevent him getting blood clots. And on the steroid, his oxygen levels got higher and higher, so much that he didn't need the oxygen after four days. And then uh, as we did his blood tests every day and we gave him our fluid every day, we showed that his sodium level came down to normal and his renal function uh, improved as well on a very gradual basis um, so that we didn't disturb the sodium too quickly, which would cause more problems. And by day five, in fact, he was eating lunch and sat out. At that point, we could stop his steroid. We rang him a week later, he continued to improve with more mobile eating and drinking. To example of how we use both ultrasound and bloods with our ability to uh, deliver the other elements of care for clinical improvements in a care home. So um, the future, I think, for hospital at home is is very bright, actually. There's a World Hospital at Home Congress has now had its second meeting. And last year we formed the World Hospital, um, with the UK Hospital at Home Society uh, to bring all the kind of UK uh, innovators in one place and to provide a, a forum so that we could improve um, our, our um, uh, our kind of standardization so that we could uh, deliver uh, a pretty similar uh, care uh, model across across all areas because you know there's a lot of variations we can benchmark uh, and we can undertake research to make hospital at home uh, the best that it can be and, and I'm very grateful to NHR uh, through the research infrastructures that I'm that I'm, I lead themes in both the ARC and the MIC in order to do that but most of all I'd like to thank the patients because without uh, patients um, challenging us to go on this journey of hospital at home, we wouldn't be here really. Over the years, we have had lots of discussions uh, as these care models have evolved, and it's the patient feedback and and the patients seeing that there is an alternative hospital admission uh, that can be preferred by them is important. And uh, uh, it's been a great opportunity to reflect on the last of 10, 20 years of my clinical academic career uh, for this lecture. So thanks very much um, for listening and for and for Warwick for employing me. Thank you. I look forward to all the research uh, that we're going to do in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dan. That was really fascinating and very interesting. And uh, now I think we can open it up for questions. We have some time for questions. Questions or feedback or comments from Okay, seems like we can we start as a silence, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just making sure that people are still, you know, if there's there's no internet glitch or anything like that, that's my yeah. Okay, there's something I saw. Okay. All right, if there are, so thank you very much, Dan. And um, first of all, um, 
you know, when you when we, when we are able to meet in campus at some point, there'll be a you know lunch or dinner that's hosted by the dean. Uh, it, it happens typically at the end of the talk, but unfortunately we can't do that. We were actually supposed to give you a small uh, token of appreciation, which also we haven't done today, as you know, the the obelisk is is, is somewhere uh, <laughs> stuck, and it'll it'll come to you at some point. And so, um, but this will all be sorted out when when you're on campus. And I look forward to meeting you in person. And also, uh, thank you very much for this talk. Yeah. Pleasure. Thanks, Rashanti. Yeah. Thank you. And there's a lot of thank you messages uh, coming yeah. on the side. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.